but and... I think it actually just went live. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, All right. Um, you you are Stephanie. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it that you do, and why did you start doing it? Good question. So, um, yes, I am Stephanie, and I am a registered nurse, um, and I've been a registered nurse now officially for three years. Um, prior to that, I um, worked in hospitals and as a research assistant um, in the Houston area. And to tell you the story of how I sort of ended ended up with nursing, I studied at Xavier University um, and received my uh, natural science um, degree as well as my Spanish degree from my prestigious alma mater. And um, thought to myself, I'm going to go out, I'm going to become a physician, and I'm going to change the world um, with these two degrees in, in my hands. And I, um, I graduated, and after a lot of work and illness and all kinds of things happening to me, I was just glad to have been done and went back home. Home at the time was Houston, Texas, and started the process of um, applying to medical school um, and just seemed to run into brick walls. Um, no matter how much I tried, no matter how much I prayed, however much I meditated, however much I whatevered, um, the doors for medical school were not opening. And so I moved on to trying to bulk up my uh, resume, if you will, and applied to work for MD Anderson Cancer Center as a research assistant in the pulmonology lab. And I did that for uh, about six months. It was grueling. Um, I always tell people that that was the year um, or so that I found out what I will allow people to do to me and what I will not allow people to do to me and or how they will make me feel. Um, and I grew a lot, um, in that time and discovered that I still had this spark for researching and understanding, um, science and, and how to help people. But this particular setting was not for me. So I left on my birthday. It was my birthday present to myself, um, because I had had enough and I knew I needed to move on. And what was it that environment that I, I knew that I go ahead, go ahead. Oh, well, what was it that originally made you interested in uh, medicine or science more broadly as a field of study? That's a good question. So, while growing up, I used to watch something called Trauma Life in the ER. <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to tell a lie. I used to watch that show with my mom constantly, and I found what they did really interesting um, in those shows i know that they're snippets i gravitated to it and i had always been very very good at science even as a, a young kid i used to tutor my classmates i used to um read i didn't i don't like reading which is funny um as i'm getting my phd um but i used to read science on purpose and so i i've always been drawn to science but then i've also had my own battle um with health. I have a disease called systemic lupus and I have a, a gradient, if you will, of the disease that has baffled many and continues to be a struggle for me, um, even in my 30s. And so I think my personal battles with disease and um, the ramifications of poor medical care mm -hmm. followed with very good medical care, but you know the damage had been done. Um, really drove my my craving, if you will, to be a physician or to be in the medical field at all. Um, and so that kind of was the drive, if you will. Um, to continue after I had graduated from college to keep trying to get into medical school. 
Um, but it was actually the job after my job with MD Anderson that opened my eyes to a, 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 an amazing possibility. Um, I started working um, in um, Cypress, Texas um, at a private hospital, which was an interesting uh, <laughs> an interesting place to be because I'd never I never realized that there was such a thing. Um, and I worked as a patient care advocate and got to spend a lot of time with nurses um, and a lot of time with patients and began to realize that where I wanted to be was making a change for patients in their lives. And so nursing became illuminated as, uh, as the better possibility for what I had actually envisioned for myself, which was to be with my patients. Um, not realizing that physicians, although they, they do see their patients, they are not with the patients as much as a nurse is with the patients. And I had envisioned my life the way a nurse works. And so um, those thoughts were happening in my mind, but I was squashing them because I, you know, I come from an African family and, you know, my Nigerian parents, she said, you want to be a doctor, that's what you need to be. And you need to do that. And not that they never, they don't support my decisions, but, you know, in Nigerian families, it's doctor, engineer, lawyer, done. <laughs> um, and there's tons of nurses that are Nigerians, which I think is funny too, but um, it's just one of those running jokes amongst us. I guess they consider us second generation Nigerian kids, um, that there's only three professions that your parents want you to be in. Um, but I, I was able to work with a mentor at this hospital, um, and she... She sat me down one day after getting, um, she must have talked to people or something. I don't know how she came to this or if she, maybe she'd been watching me, observing me, or I don't know. And she said, I don't know why you haven't done this yet, but you need to apply to nursing school. You can't be here forever. This is not, the, this is not your top level of performance. You can't do this for the rest of your life, and I won't let you. That's what she told me. And I looked at her. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what do you mean? She said, you can't. This is not who you are. This is not what you're supposed to do for the rest of your life. And I said, okay, well, I don't even know how to start. She was like, well, all you have to do is look for nursing schools, and I will write you a letter of recommendation, and I will help you build what you need to apply to nursing school. Little did I know, she, was, she had been giving me tasks along the way that weren't related to work. One, make a CV. Um, the other one was, you need to write me a goal statement. These are things she was asking me to do before she had sat me down to say, you need to apply to nursing school. So I did that. I had everything I needed to apply to nursing school because this woman saw something in me that I didn't see. Um, and I always tell people, if you are unsure of something, it's usually easier to go with the things that you know rather than opening a new can of worms. And so I applied to my beloved Xavier and I got in and it was almost like, it was almost like, you know, Jesus was standing behind me and slapped me in the back of the head like, duh, I've been trying to get you to turn around and look at this window I opened while I was slamming all these other doors, but I'm glad somebody finally got you to turn around. You know, um, it just happened so fast. And so I, I applied, I got into the Midas program and um, I, it's a 20 month, I, I, one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my life. Um, 20 months, you get your master's degree, uh, master's of science in nursing, having to learn everything that a bachelor's prepared nurse knows, as well as the things that a master's degree, or a master's prepared nurse, excuse me, would have to know as well in 20 months. And came out on the other side, some scars and bruises, but no worse for the wear. Um, and began my practice as a nurse. Um, was lucky to work um, with some amazing people um, in Cincinnati at the bedside as a nurse. 
Um, and I'm now, I'm now moving to research. As I said, I'm working on my PhD um, after a few, a few, let's call them monumental patients in my life and also an in, another incredible opportunity in my life um, to go to Guatemala um, and work with some of the best human beings I know. Um, doing that work and seeing the way our, uh, it's an illness care system, it's not a healthcare system in this country, um, works, I decided that it was time for a change. Um, and that although I was making an impact at the bedside um, with my patients, it, I was not satisfied. I had not reached my maximum potential. And it was time to do what I thought was necessary um, to make that possible. There's a, a lot in there. There's also There's a, lot. A, a very inspiring story in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, when, when you went on, did you go on the last Xavier Guatemala trip? Yes, I have been going since 2000, as, uh, 2014, I was a student. And then after that, started working um, as a triage nurse for the trip. And did uh, you get with uh, Amir? Uh, I did. Uh, I did. Incredible soul. Awesome. Incredible soul. Yeah. Well, they actually might have met by accident. At, I think we may have. At the... Um, I don't know, we were setting up tables in a conference room for the Guatemala trip. I think, I think we did. I, the more I thought about it just now, I actually think I did. I have met you. Yes, I have. Oh. In person, live and in color. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. So what, what made you go from um, just a master's in nursing to wanting to be a PhD? So um, I, I, maybe before I, I had a, a number of patients die. Um, it was like I, and this is something that's no well known in the nursing world that there are some people who carry a, a cloud, um, and I seemed it seemed that somebody's cloud jumped onto me the last few weeks I was working. I just kept losing people, and in the year in that year um, I had been very very ill as well. Um, and I knew the year before, because I had gone as a student on the Guatemala trip, um, that although my job was really making me feel like I was doing something, those last few weeks of my, my work there, I just knew when you lose a patient, <clears throat> Something happens to you on the inside, and if anybody tells you that it doesn't, then I don't know. Uh, something happens to you that either you have to kind of harden up on the outside, or it, not that it deters you, but it makes you think about more. And I say more because you start to think what is it that could have been done to prevent this from happening? Because that's how we're taught um, to some degree. I think if, if the human being could discover immortality, that they would most certainly use it and take part. Um, but for me, what happened was I kept losing people. I kept thinking, there is something that we're not doing. There's something that's missing. I don't know why we call it a healthcare system. I had a lot of questions. I don't know why we call it a healthcare system because we're not caring for anybody's health. Everybody's sick here. Um, I don't see where we're preventing any of this from happening. Um, I don't see the ramification or the, 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 the consequences of a prevention model anywhere in what I have just experienced over the last five weeks. I just, I was really frustrated. Um, with the way that I had to provide healthcare because I was in a system and I don't have control of the system. And I was weary. And so I started asking people in my circle, 
um, that either have been mentors or teachers, I got all these questions um, and I need answers. I need help because I can't, I can't live like this. I was, uh, I was crying all the time. I felt very unhappy. I was very unfulfilled at that, at those moments. I was very, I was having cognitive dissonance to sum it up in two words. And I was told by a very good friend of mine now that I had questions that a PhD prepared nurse would have. And I said, well, I, I not, I can't go back to school. I don't, I can't go back to school. Uh, much like people my age, I have debt and I need to work because I need to pay off my debt and you know, all, all the reasons why I shouldn't do what my body, my brain, everything was telling me to do. And after a couple of conversations and more discerning and, and more people dying, um, I, and, and, and I need to add this, and remembering my promise to myself and my uncle um, that one day I would be a doctor, number one. Number two, that was my promise to my uncle was number one. Number two, that I promised myself that I would go back to my home. And home in this context means Umaguma Owere Imo State, Nigeria, to help what, from what I saw uh, from a visit there, um, to help my people um, be well. When I remembered those two things, I think it was almost like we were talking about astrology before, but um, the stars aligned <laughs> <laughs> in my mind, and I something clicked, and it said, you, you're being ridiculous. You need to go back to school. Um, and so that's how I ended up getting to the PhD sort of track in my life, um, not to mention what I experienced going to Guatemala and, and, and seeing the work that's being done by this incredible group of human beings. Um, my friends, my friends. Well, it's a, it's a very beautiful story. It also, uh, at least the common theme I saw was turning what seems to be misfortune into inspiration and hope and new opportunities. Um, I, this is, this is a bit of a sterile question, but yeah, we had um, my friend Tony on for the first episode on nursing, and he works in a spine unit. But I was wondering what the sort of difference between doctoral nursing work is from the uh, RN work. Okay, so um, you know, registered nurse. Generally, these are I'm, I'm about to make some generalizations here. Um, generally work at the bedside or in a doctor's office providing direct patient care. Um, and, and this goes from giving shots to uh, doing CPR um, in the ICU setting, which is where I, where I was, um, managing ventilated patients, patients with chest tubes, um, patients with hemodynamic monitoring. That was, that's, where, that's where I, uh, the kind of situations that I was dealing with. Um, and, and the difference between a registered nurse and a, a doctorally prepared nurse is that first I must make the delineation that there are two types of doc prepared, doctorally prepared nurses. There's a practice doctor, which many people um, might not realize that there is a difference. There is practice doctors um, such as the DNP, which is a doctorate of nursing practice. And then there's the PhD, which is the philosophical doctorate. Um, and um, for me, I wanted to do the PhD because I wanted to create science. And so any PhD prepared anybody that's, you know, not excluding a physician, a philosopher, a theologian, um, those are people who work to create science. Um, they're working to drive the discipline that they work in. Um, they create the theories, they create 
um, the, you know, they may even create methodologies um, of scientific research. They generate, uh, you know, um, new innovative ways of thinking about existing or new problems. Um, while the, do the doctorate um, of practice degree would be the person who works in, in a clinical setting. In my, in my case, as a nurse, a DMP would work more. There are DMPs who are actually nurse practitioners. There are DMPs that um, work with PhDs to translate some of these theoretical abstractions into real life um, uh, approaches. Um, DMPs work a lot with evidence-based um, practice guidelines that are created um, from research generated by PhDs. Um, so that's that's the difference between the two types. And so as you can see, between a, a, a registered nurse at the bedside and a doctorally prepared nurse, the difference is research, is really what the difference is. Because at the end of the day, we operate from the same theories and things like that, uh, same um, same modalities. Our concerns are still from our meta paradigm concepts of person, environment, health, and caring. Um, and so for us, the center of everything we do is the person. Um, and that's how it's always been in nursing, and I don't think it will change. Um, but that's the major, the big difference. But then you, I want to also, uh, if you will, give a shout out to our master's prepared nurses who um, take on leadership or education roles. Um, there are many uh, MSNs that so, uh, they, they serve as faculty in nursing schools, aside from other degree, you know, other degrees that would work in a nursing school. Um, they serve as leaders in the hospital setting, in, in uh, health systems. Um, they serve as leaders in our national organizations. Um, and that's anyone, any level of degree can do that. Um, but generally speaking, master's degree prepared nurses usually are prepared to lead or to teach. Um, and then doctorally prepared would work either in practice um, with research or be in, um, as they say, the ivory tower. Um, creating science. And one of my goals is to make sure that my ladder from the ivory tower is used at least every hour um, because the ivory tower really isn't the best place to be if you mean to make change um, at the human level. Um, the 30,000 foot view is great but the 30,000 foot view doesn't give you the details and the intricacies that, I, that occur at the ground level. Um, so that's, that's if that, I hope that answers your question. Oh, it does, certainly. Yeah. And you actually, I, I wanted to say something. You mentioned how, you know, it kind of sounds like you take misfortune and turn it into uh, inspiration. There's something I tell my students, because um, when you're learning to be a nurse, it's really hard. Um, and that's really an understatement, and it can be really frustrating and appear to be um, almost, it's, it, it's so exhausting, you know. You feel like you're running up against things all the time. And one of the things I tell my students is that every obstacle you come against must be turned into an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Just because it appears to be an obstacle, sometimes you got to peer through the mortar not every brick is laid exactly right. And sometimes you get peer holes. You got to look through the mortar to see the opportunity on the other side of the obstacle. And so, you know, I tell my students that you're always so positive. Why are you so positive? It's because if you don't, if you don't start to change the way you frame your world, your world will frame you. And so, I've decided that that's how I'm gonna deal with life so i think uh when we get a cryptosophy store with merchandise that'll have to be a t-shirt i like it i'll <laughs> buy the first one <laughs> <laughs> um you mentioned sort of your experience practicing in um, patient care and in research made you push towards the theoretical side where you could affect mm -hmm. big changes what were those 
particular aspects of nursing that are the most consequential issues that need to be fixed uh, that drove you to want to get your doctorate? I think um, the model that we use to to conduct what we are selling as healthcare is the number one thing that has driven me to um, to to want to do this, to do nursing in this way, um, and then if I were to think about other um, sort of events or or situations, it it really for me came. I I, I went to Guatemala and worked with them. Um, other students and, and the medical team at the time who were creating something that I had dreamed about. As I said, I want to do some sort of something, a clinic, a create a healthcare system, something for, for where I come from, for my original origins, if you will, if I can use the word twice. Um, mm-hmm. I want because I I traveled to Nigeria and I saw some of the things I saw and some of the things I um, got to be a part of. Really, it didn't make sense to me that people were suffering from disease that they don't have to suffer from. While you know, I can go to the doctor anytime I feel like, and and well, not anytime I feel like, but I think you catch my drift. It's it just it was not fair and and i it may be misguided it may be naive it might be whatever you want to label it but i don't believe that the world um was created to be unfair uh, i don't believe that when you know something you sit on it um and for me experiencing those two different experiences guatemala and nigeria kind of solidified in my mind that when you've been awakened to something, you must act on it. And at that moment, I was awakened to the idea of prevention and the idea that um, healthcare was not created with, not all healthcare was created with the person in mind. And I say that in addition to the fact that I have my own personal experiences that have landed me in the hospital many times because I was ignored. Um, <clears throat> And so given all these things like kind of wrapped together, I, I, I thought to myself, I have, like, I, I, I'm not able to sit quietly about this. I'm not able to, I'm not able to um, stay. It's a very, it's a very now to say be woke. Um, but I was awakened to something, a problem that I could not, I could no longer sit back and watch. Um, and the more I have delved into my own studies of the world and, 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 and in my case, sickle cell anemia and, and having African sensibilities because I am an African, I've grown tired of the biomedical model governing the way that we do healthcare globally, globally now. And I say globally to include the United States because if we are all signing up to do medicine, to help, to provide beneficence and to avoid malfeasance, and some people say our mal- maleficence is mm-hmm. how I was taught to say, then we need to change our model to reflect that because at this point I'm not seeing it. Um, And uh, this is where I I get kind of, I ruffle feathers and I've part of this growth or or this change in mindset has also been sort of the, the thickening that I talked about, the thickening of skin um, to deal with the people that I ruffle their feathers. Um, with the way that I speak about the healthcare system that we have. Um, and that's globally because it's not working. We're, we're sicker than we've been, ever been before. Um, and we have people dying from disease that it, 
it shouldn't be happening. Um, and so uh, for me, that was kind of, that was kind of it. Um, and I think for me internationally was not that it's more important, but I felt I could have a greater impact internationally because I understand it better, if you will. I understand, not that I actually understand anything because when you're getting your PhD, one of the first lessons you learn is that you don't know anything. And it's okay to say that. You learn in, in your studies as a PhD student that the more you learn, the more you don't know. And so for me, I felt the international stage was actually a more comfortable place than the United States. And so that's kind of why I've drifted to that. Not that I've drifted, but that I've moved to that um, sort of realm of study. That's very interesting. I just want to say, given your life story, I uh, hope it goes terribly wrong for you so that we'll see you as a high ranking member in the WHO in a decade. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see about that. <laughs> we'll see about that. That seems yeah. to be your means of handling adversity. That's how it works. <laughs> Uh, I, it's how it works. I, that's it's kind of funny, you know. I can laugh now, and and most days I don't laugh. But usually, when things get tough, that's when I know I'm doing the right thing. That's how I've lived most of my life. Is if there's not some sort of epic battle happening in my life, I'm not heading the right direction. So if there's turmoil, Stephanie's heading the right direction. Um, and so I I continue. It hasn't changed. Um, I, every semester so far in my PhD education has been something. And so that means I'm on the right path. Um, either I've been hospitalized or a uh, housing situation has been awful or, you know, insert problem here. Um, but every, I'm telling you, every single semester, including the summer, um, has been difficult. But I have been blessed and, and I'm very grateful to have people. And they support me along the way. Yeah, I did want to ask, um, how young were you diagnosed with lupus? And I wanted to ask because uh, my mom has lupus and um, my aunt's sister died of lupus. Not a real aunt, but a family friend aunt. Yeah. Um, I was 13 going on 14. So we're talking about, uh, we're getting close to 20 years in the next two years will be, well, next three years. No, nope, next two years, I just turned 31. Wow. Um, next three years, it'll be 20 years. Wow. Um, yeah, that's a long time. Um, and it was not fun. It's still not fun. Um, my disease um, has been so severe that I had to have a, a, an autologous stem cell transplant um, back in 2009. Um, and it worked for a while. Um, but the funny thing about this disease is when you have a more severe form, it doesn't really go to sleep, if you will. It's what we, that's how we discuss it. Um, yeah. It's kind of in a, a, a hibernation um, and can be awakened at any time. And so um, stress is one of the number one triggers and I don't know if you can tell, but I could be stressed. Um, um, and it's been an interesting um, juggling act. Um, but, it, you know, it, again, I don't think I would have the experience that I have now um, if it wasn't for this disease. Um, and I wouldn't have the same level of maybe not, I can't understand everybody's pain, but I think I have a, a different perspective as a registered nurse because I, because I suffer chronically. Mm -hmm. um, it gives you a different appreciation for, for, for when people are sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that level of empathy is sort of hard to reach as a nurse, I think, for a lot of people. And it, and it is. I mean, 
and even it's it's hard for me too. I'm not gonna tell you a lie, because I I I try my best to squash that part of me if I can, if it's not actually physically apparent on a day, um, that I'm working or or whatever I'm I'm teaching or whatever the case may be, um, because it because sometimes you can it can almost become too personal. You know, there is a certain degree of objectivity that you have to have, especially in a critical care environment. Um, to do your job, because if you're relating too much on a personal level, then that becomes kind of a, we call it blurring of the lines. Um, and you lose sight of what you need to be doing to take care of the patient. Um, but there are moments that that is appropriate. And then there are moments when you got to be on your, on your, um, on your duty and doing what you're supposed to be doing as a nurse. So you have to find a, a really you got to strike a balance, um, and I I try I've tried my best to do that. Um, a lot of times I end up helping people with problems that they have because I've had those problems, and so I'm able to give them advice and they try it and then they come back and tell me, oh wow this really worked how did you know that? Then I start to talk about things that might be more personal as opposed to walking into a situation. Of, well, guess what? I have lupus, and this is what you should do. You know, it's not really the, it's not really the way we do it. Certainly not. Yeah. Uh, well, I wanted to move to, uh, as you said, ruffling feathers, and I hope we yeah. hope we can ruffle many. It's uh, okay. It's, I'm ready. It's my goal in life. Yeah. I did have one uh, crowdsourced question mm -hmm. from uh, an OT, and um, I was wondering in your experience how you see. Uh, nurses relate to occupational therapists, physical therapists, and other specialists, and whether or not you think that um, these different specializations really understand what the other one does and how that affects patient care. I think I'm going to answer the third question, third, second question, about do we know what each other does? No, we don't. I can say that boldly. We don't. Um, I myself am still growing to learn what each of my interdisciplinary teammates do. Um, because in school, we don't actually learn together. This about to ruffle feathers, get ready. <laughs> One of the big issues with any with education in medicine, and that's including all these disciplines, PT, OT, speech therapy. Um, physicians, nurses, um, any any of those professions know what the other is learning. So if you don't know what the other is learning, how can you possibly understand how to relate to them when you start working together? I don't know why we think we can work in an interdisciplinary team when we lack understanding of each other. Do I think that you eventually learn it? Yes, because you have to, but you're learning it on the job. Why can't we incorporate it in our education? It's actually not as hard as you would think because I know a university in Cincinnati that has classes for this. However, we have to push it. It needs to be part of our curriculum. So that's one thing. How do I think nurses relate to OTs? It's difficult because a lot of the things that probably we do in terms of, I'll, I'll focus on what I really know, which is activities of daily living. We call them ADLs. A lot mm -hmm. of the things that we do for our patients, I'll, I'll talk about cardiovascular stuff. In terms of like after surgery, OTs can help um, patients perfect those things and work on those things more than we can as nurses because we don't have the time. And so I think if we, first of all, understood what the other did as one, and then knew that we can consult each other to help each other relationship. Um, a few of the things that I understand of occupational therapy is that um, it gets confused for PT all the time. That's one thing, physical therapy, PT. Um, and that Occupational therapy is, I would, I don't, I, um, 
I would say maybe more geared towards those things that get you through the day um, that may be overlooked. So I chose ADLs. So something as simple as buttoning your shirt or um, a way to tie your shoes, um, a better way to, let's say, hold a device so that you can be more effective in doing what it is you're aiming to do. So if that's your cane or, um, or a grabber of some sort. Um, I've seen some OTs actually go to the extent of um, movement, like helping people with their body movement, mm -hmm. um, helping them to understand how to use certain parts of their body in better ways, which is, can sometimes move to the physical therapy side of things. Um, then I've also noticed um, some OTs work with sensory problems as well. Um, so if someone has an issue, let's say nerve damage of some sort, or they have um, issues with, they become anxious because they have sensory overload from certain, they're just out of surgery and they don't, like they can't remember how to do things and they need help. And so they're overloaded from that situation. I've seen OTs help with that. Um, and those are all things that are all part of activities of daily living that we as nurses, we can't, we can't do all of that. We just can't. Um, we can get you up, get you to the bathroom, get your gown on. Um, but we don't have the time to sit with the patient and what is it that you need? What am I missing about this exercise that we just did? Is the way that I am helping you to get up, is that the most effective way? Um, you know, think they, they, they're able to go deeper than we are, if that makes sense. We're not educated at that level, I don't think, to be able to offer um, really, really helpful and effective ways of getting through the day, if you will. And that, I, I know I'm limited in my own knowledge of how the relationship should and can work or does work. Um, and so what I'm giving is a very um, limited, and sort of gravel versus sand description, mm. if you will. I think one of the interesting things to me is that we don't have more um, cross-disciplinary studies. That's what I'm saying. We just don't, and it's and it's an it's a it's a to use an English word a bloody shame, mm -hmm. um, because I think part of It's just not, it's not right. How can we be, and this is, this is you, the buzzword for a long time was inter, this interdisciplinary team, interdisciplinary working. Um, <laughs> what, I can't work in a team, I don't know who my teammates are. Maybe LeBron James can do that. But if I, from what I heard, LeBron James knew what each of his new teammates bring to the table. Okay, from what I saw on a, a news, a sports news thing, he went to the company owner and said, this person can do this and I can give this to him. And this person can do this and I can bring this to the team. You, there's no way for me as a nurse to do my job to the maximum if I can't work with my team. But as we discussed previously in, a, in, a, in our own time together, we have been taught to fear what we don't know. We've been socialized that way in the United States of America, at least, to fear what we do not know. And so part of the issue becomes, sometimes we don't learn about our interdisciplinary teammates in a timely fashion when we get out and into the, into the world because we don't know that we can consult them and they'll be nice to us and they'll talk to us and they'll help us. We don't know, we don't even know where they are in the hospital. We don't know who to call, or if we were told who to call, that person has changed, that that ability goes to the higher up, and then you have to go through the higher up to ask the, it, it's, it's convoluted is what I'm getting at. Yeah. And so if we spend more time while we were in school getting to know each other, not that we're gonna work with the people that we're in school with, but at least we leave when we take our degrees, that we pay lots of money for, we leave 
And that degree also gives us the ability to work well in a team because we understand teammates are. You know, that's just my thoughts. Um, again, I ruffle feathers because I no longer sit on what I believe. I just say what I think. Um, and that's okay. You know, that's okay. Certainly. I'm, I welcome disagreement too. I want to learn. So if I don't say what I think or what I believe, I can't learn because I won't ruffle anybody's feathers. Um, <laughs> but I'm you completely. Um, I, I do want to stick on the particulars, but I think we might run out of time. And I know you've got a lot of international focuses. So mm -hmm. let's let's see how many uh, birds we can throw stones at in terms of rough okay. feathers here. Okay. <laughs> what is the, how do you view the difference between domestic medicine and international medicine? And um, why did you find the international um, cases more interesting than just working in the United States? Um. So I heard the I I got you on the last part. Will you tell me the first part again? Oh, the what is the relationship between um, international medicine as opposed to domestic medicine? Okay, all right. So I'm gonna answer that first. Um, I think the relationship is that we live in a globalized world. Excuse me. That means that. What we do in this country, this country being the United States, affects everybody else. And what other people do affects everybody else. So hot topic and also a feather ruffler, vaccination. You, we move so quickly from one place to the other that disease spreads just as fast. Um, and as we know with the progression of technology and the progression of um, transportation, we're able to alert each other to those movements of disease faster. Um, and so what, what, what we do in terms of vaccinating ourselves in one country directly affects any country that that particular country might go to. So uh, example, if you're moving from the United States to let's say, now I'll talk about Nigeria. If you're moving from here to Nigeria, you have the potential if you're not, you know, if you're not vaccinated or if you are vaccinated to come across malaria, um, at one time Ebola, um, typhoid or typhus, um, any myriad of infectious disease. And the same is true for a Nigerian coming in contact with a United States citizen. You have the potential, um, I left tuberculosis off you know, of the list in terms of Nigeria, um, but the same is true the other way around. You have the potential as a United States citizen to bring measles, mumps, um, whooping cough, also tuberculosis. You have the potential to move these diseases back and forth. And the problem with moving diseases from one environment to another is mutation. And um, mutation because you're the, the existing bacteria in, on the in the country, on the continent, might not look the same as the bacteria that you bring to whichever country you're going to. Um, and so that's just one big over over compassing sort of idea that I think about a lot. Um, vaccination is not my extreme field of expertise, although I, I do work um, to some degree in research as a, as a bedside nurse in research on, with studies that um, talk about or are or, or, or studying vaccination. Um, but that's one, that's one of the pictures I like to use for people to understand globalization of healthcare mm -hmm. and, how, and how we are intertwined. It's very, very antiquated to believe that, well, if it's happening here, it can't happen over here. You know, if it's happening there, it can't happen here. That's 
completely antiquated. It is incorrect and has led to the death of a number of people. Um, I mean, just think about the Ebola, Ebola crisis in two, was it 2014. It, it did not just stay on the continent of Africa. Um, it, it, we had cases of Ebola in the United States. Um, and so globalization is the reason I think I, I, well, not that I find international health easier, but I, I, that's one of the reasons I was able to understand international health better. Another reason is again, because of my experiences abroad and also growing up listening to stories of um, health and healthcare in Nigeria. I didn't grow up with stories of healthcare in the United States. Um, I didn't grow up with stories of how things were done in the United States. And so culture informs the way that I understand healthcare and healthcare systems. Therefore, I'm more inclined to international health than I than I am to probably domestic health. I find the system in the United, United States to be very complicated because I actually live in it. Um, I have to use it daily, and I find it to be really not made for a sick person. Um, it is exhausting. It is frustrating. It is broken. Um, it's not meant again, not meant for a sick person to use, which is really um, annoying to say the least um, because it's for sick people to use. Um, but you have to have the energy to jump through the hoops. And, it, and the other problem is if you don't know what hoops to jump through, you are doomed in this country. Um, and not that that's not true in other places, but more so I think sometimes when you when you have a system and it's so broken, it's almost not that different than what people term as third world countries, which is incorrect language. Um, but it's, you're not, it's not really any different. You have people dying every day from preventable disease in this country. Um, just like you have people dying every day from preventable diseases in low and middle income countries. Um, the difference is infrastructure and culture so and i think our culture is interesting here in the united states because we have a culture that uses the term healthcare system when really if you were if you're providing health because the idea of a healthcare system is to provide health then you would be focused on prevention and not an illness model like we have right right now our model is to react not to be proactive and that's I mean, as I'm talking to you, I'm squeezing my head and massaging my head because it's just, it is headache inducing um, and frustrating as a user of the system. It is so frustrating. Um, and yeah. I think part of, part of it for me is I'm in the system. I use the system. I work for the system. I needed to get away from the system if you will, for my, my sort of career path um, and go to something that I felt I could impact more. Um, well, the good news is uh, if you give it a few years, we'll have a pharmaceutical for frustration. We'll just treat you that way. I know. <laughs> I, <laughs> I know, I know. And then there will be something for that very soon, I'm sure. Um, yeah. It will be a numbing pill um, of I some sort. Uh, sort of enter this international picture from your, um, I don't know if this was your dissertation. It uh, will be my dissertation. It, oh, it will be your dissertation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Published in Wiley now for anyone who has access to a school library. That's where you can get it. And I'll put a link in the description. Um, but can you sort of talk to me about um, what your inspiration for writing on community health programs and sickle cell? sickle cell anemia is and sort of how that got up and running for you well again i there was an obstacle and i needed an opportunity so i turned my frown upside down 
And as part of your PhD education, at least at my university, you're tasked with the job of deciding what you will be studying for your dissertation. Not every school does it that way, but this one in particular does, and I'm very grateful for that. But I was floundering um, in my first year. I didn't, as you can tell, my, my thoughts are really big. Um, and so sort of narrowing my focus was really difficult because part of my, my body wanted to be in Africa, then part of my body wanted to be in Central America. And then the other part of my body wanted to be in the United States to do prevention work. And so I, I was really torn about what my topic would be. Um, and I happened upon a, a um, I, we're required to go to these research collaborative events and where you hear about other scientists and what they're doing. And I went to one and I had planned to go to the one the following month, I believe, but time opened up for me and I went to the one in that particular month. And I heard uh, one of our scientists, our, 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 our um, faculty at my university talking about Sierra Leone and sickle cell anemia and the work that he's doing there and what he plans for his future. And the more he spoke, the more I heard the story that I have been telling myself about what I want to do in my own career. And I began to cry in the middle of this um, research collaborative, which is really not, you don't do that. It's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not normal. Um, but I was overcome um, by emotion because I hadn't, I hadn't seen somebody do it yet. I hadn't seen some, I, everything I had been telling myself was all dreaming and philosophizing and waxing and hoping. And I hadn't seen it in, in person yet. Um, and I met somebody who was doing what I dream from my own village, my own country. And, and I afterward, of course, sat and talked with this researcher and um, decided that this was gonna be my dissertation, but I had a different take on it after I started reading more. And this is, you know, side note to all the people out there, I don't like reading. <laughs> I don't know why, um, but like I said before, I, if it's science, I will read it. And if it's in Spanish, I'll definitely read it. So those are the two ways you can get me to read. Um, and this is science. And so I was told to you know, read about the disease, read about Sierra Leone and, and to learn more. And the more I read, the more I saw the word Nigeria coming up over and over again in the research. I didn't realize it at the time, but now I know Nigeria is the number one country in the world for sickle cell anemia. I didn't know how I was gonna penetrate my country's walls in terms of healthcare and, and community health. But in reading for my dissertation, I discovered the way that I was gonna, that I will achieve my own hopeful career goals. Um, well, I do have to mention one of my favorite sentences or set of sentences and the paper is that you started with 185 articles and seven met the selection criteria. That's right. I'm picky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm picky. So if you could like summarize what... Uh... Yeah, so I'm going to go to that. So as I, as I started reading more, um, I discovered that there is an issue. This is the premise of my dissertation. The issue being that we are missing something in terms of treating sickle cell anemia on the continent of Africa. Um, we, the end of every paper, right, is, well, there's issues of education and lack of uh, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, okay? That's usually the end of most of those paper, papers. So I began to wonder, what what does it take then to create the healthcare that they they're aiming to create in this context 
that was the key word was context. The problem is that we don't have a way of treating sickle cell anemia right now in the context of these low to middle income countries, which is what this integrative review is about that I, that I published. And the, the issue becomes that we are using a biomedical model created in the Western world and using incredible, these are incredible guidelines for sickle cell anemia treatment, but they were created by people who don't have the context of an African infrastructure. Okay. So the issue is we might be able to bring medication to, you know, Sierra Leone to Nigeria to insert African country here, but it can't, it might not be sustainable. And, and that's why you took sciences. it. Oh, sorry, it cut out. But no, yeah. That's the primary reason you take uh, what you call a community health approach. That's correct. The other piece about community health approach, though, is that in order to be sustainable, you must build capacity. And in order to build capacity, you must understand what capacity exists. And if you're going to know what kind of capacity exists, you must understand the culture. So health, what what differentiates a cultural understanding from say like the scientific disease profile and treatment of sickle cell anemia? That's such a good question. Cause I was about to answer that before you even asked me. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. So the issue is that whether we want to acknowledge it or not, communicate about it. It's how we make decisions about health care. If the culture does not value a certain disease or even acknowledge said disease, they will not make health care decisions based on that disease. Let me give you something else. Culture itself is the mechanism by which we communicate, okay? There are traditions, values, beliefs that inform the way that we relate to each other according to our culture. And culture is also created by the way that we relate to each other, communicate with each other. So if our culture, and I, I'll use my own family as an example, if our culture states, if you don't say the name of the disease, it doesn't exist. This, this is my own family now. If we don't say the name of the disease, therefore it doesn't exist. What kinds of decisions will that family make about their health? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, mean, I assume uh, not very many. You don't make, exactly. You will not make decisions about your health care if you don't believe you have a health care issue, mm. if it's in your culture to, instead of say the name of, the, of a disease to say, oh, I'm just not having a good day, or in my family, you just simply don't acknowledge it for some of my family members. You simply don't acknowledge it. It doesn't exist. If something doesn't exist, do you decide about it on any, do you decide anything about that non-existent problem? No. So if we are trying to help in, you know, in a, in a place where, number one, it's possible that in much of the stigmatized as evil eye or a spirit or insert whatever it is, if we don't understand that that's what the, the actual root is, you can't kill the weed. You have to get the you have to get to the root of the problem. Am I asking people to change their culture? No. I'm just asking that the science be more culturally appropriate. What would you say to someone um who might argue that in some cultures the the taking on board of certain beliefs, whether uh, religious or otherwise, are actually incompatible with science? And that 
uh, the culture does need to be changed because what we know to be true about some particular issue um, from science is just never going to work with this belief system. Um, I don't believe in never. That's what I would tell the person. Well, wouldn't we have to, in some situations, change the belief system? Um, I think. I think so. One of the things, and and I'll give you. There's some research right now. Um, in terms of like witch doctors, um, which is a, a popular um, means of getting healthcare in a lot of countries, and not just on the continent of Africa, um, that is using um, the science of 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 witch doctor to ease. And so some of these, some of these scientists have been able to, I'm sorry, it cut out. Oh yeah. I was just saying that there is some, there's some research that exists right now um, about the use of the power of a witch doctor to educate a community about a disease. So what the researchers are doing is understanding that the witch doctor is the center of the culture. Mm. And so you educate the educator. Uh, um, about a disease process, but you have to, you have to, you can't walk in. I know everything. That's the other problem. Yes. Yeah, so you can't walk in with the complex of, I know all, which is the second part of my dissertation is oppressive behavior. Um, you can't walk in with that mindset and think you're going to get anywhere. No, certainly not. Um, I think I, I was thinking in terms of this story I read where uh, polio was almost eradicated. I think it was in Pakistan and surrounding areas. And then uh, some religious figure, a popular religious figure in that region said that um, vaccinations are a conspiracy from the Jews and um, you actually don't need to get these vaccinations. They're constructed to make your kids dumb. And then polio resurged in that area. Uh, but do you, do you think in that respect that the scientific method and scientific findings in medicine can be made compatible across contexts and that we can just go teach the teachers? Um, or do we have to argue that certain beliefs are simply invalid and that other people should change their minds about the way that health works? I think that that's um, that's a good question. I think that I'm trying to find the best way to word this. I think that the proliferation of the scientific method over the last how many eons of time has been effective in some places, and as you're saying not compatible in others. In those places that it's not been compatible, what has historically happened is it's just the other has been squashed and science takes over, right? Um, or religion or whatever, government takes over. And my fear of saying, yes, the culture needs to change or that one's belief is just invalid is that perpetuates oppressive behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have a problem with the idea that you can just say their belief is invalid because for them it's not invalid. Yeah, I think, um, I think there's, there's two strands of that and one of them is actually compassionate. Um, that's, that's what I'm getting at is there's a certain, th when you come to the understanding that there is not one single way to do things, that's the place where you might see culture change. Like for us in Guatemala, Mayans have been using their water source for as long as Mayans have been around, but not knowing that the water is not clean and causing death to children when they're young because of the parasites, it was hard to convince a whole group of people to change the way that they have been living their lives for the last thousands of years until 
you begin to respect each other's culture and come to a common ground of we have this problem and you're saying that there's a way to possibly deal with it. We might, let us see if we can try it. Let's see if we can try it. And you, you have to also, as the, as the researcher in this case, be patient because they're not, not every single person, like the, the, the person you were describing with the polio vaccine, not every person is going to be on your side. In fact, more than half might not be on your side. Uh -huh. But you can't give up. I think that's where I'm kind of going. Yeah, certainly. You need to acknowledge the fact that this belief, this way of health, this way of understanding health has been here since long before your people were even created. Right? I'm not going to come here and squash what other people think because it's been working for them and and the definition of working again defined by the culture for them for thousands of years who am i to come with what i think is right and squash what they think is right i need to understand i'm here to understand how it is that you have been doing things and then if you are open if is the key word to the way that i have learned about this particular disease process and how to quell it, then I present my ideas. I'm not walking into anywhere guns blazing. Yeah. No, I don't believe in that. I think that that is why we are where we are now as an international community. I think that science can sometimes be used in the way that the British basically conquered half the world. I think it's been like that previously i think we're getting better in the science community um but i refuse to perpetuate that way of of living of of doing science of yeah i can't do that and at the end of the day if my idea doesn't take i cannot um i won't beat myself up i'm not going to bash the community that i'm trying to work with i'm not going to bash them I'm not going to um, color them as non-compliant, which is a term that we have developed because we don't know how to deal with different people. Yep, ruffling feathers. <laughs> um, I'm not. I, I'm not going to use that terminology. Our truths are different, and so I'm not going to ask somebody to change their truth because I think mine's right. I'm going to present my idea. If it works, it works. And if it doesn't, I have done what I am supposed to do or what I've sworn to do as a nurse in presenting the idea. Every single person has the free will to make a choice. And it's free because they get to make the choice. I'm, I can't make anybody. We don't make anybody here adhere to a diet. We don't make anybody here um, I mean, at least not right now. We're not penalizing anybody for having multiple cardiopulmonary bypass surgeries. Yeah. Your premium might go up. <laughs> but you, you see what I mean? Isn't there yeah. cases such as like um, negligent homicide from parents who don't believe in science and don't take their sick kid to a hospital? There are. Where, I mean, I think that I mean, it's very interesting because I've listened to a a variety of scientists be called culturally imperialist or culturally oppressive for some of their views. And yet at the same time, if we wanted to take something like the Mayan drinking water case, um, at what point do we say, no, you don't get to keep killing kids with parasites? Mm -hmm. And I think that there's there's an arrogant approach that we know so much and perhaps even sometimes a racist approach like these primitive people. Um, mm -hmm. but I think there's also a deeply compassionate frustration that emerges for the victims of certain beliefs. Yeah. And I think um, maybe to some extent the political polarization and other things have made this conversation fraught. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, wouldn't you have to say at the very least that um, 
the global medicine that we've established is more correct about medicine and healthy living and human well-being than um, any of our ancient religious traditions or anything like that have ever espoused. And that we, um, can, we can say certain facts about health that are true of human beings regardless of who they are. Yeah, I think that there are some things. You drink too much water, you're going to die. Uh, you put your hand in fire, you're going to get burned. Those kinds of things, yes. Um, I think that those are commonalities that we all share. Um, I think that to some degree, mm, I find it difficult to call our current model completely correct. I think it's. I think you're right to say it might be more correct. I was um, the the model necessarily of healthcare, yeah. but the scientific um, truths and theories and disease yeah. problems. So not. I think problems. I think so. I think so. But I also think, as I said, the more we learn, the more we don't know. Mm. So which is which is the problem, because as we uncover more things, we're still learning. From about what we just uncovered. You see what I mean? And yeah. so it's difficult. I think that's the difficulty of medicine. I think that's why it's so hard sometimes to, I mean, every week coffee is good for you, then the next week it's not. <laughs> every other week eggs are good for you, and then it's not. You see what I mean? Like it's, it's obviously the, 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 the thing that I get from all those kinds of back and forth is everything in moderation but i i i do believe that there are things that we do know for sure or more or i should say for more sure than we have known in the past we don't have terminology for that yet in english um but <laughs> um there are some things we do know more about than we have before and there are some things that are true just across the board um however i think the problem is that we assume everybody believes the same thing that we believe like i said if it's not acknowledged as a problem then you can't you can't fix something that doesn't exist for another person um and until you can either find a way to make it exist or the person changes their mind about the existence of said disease or whatever the problem is it's hard to find a middle ground um unless you're able to understand better about their culture. Um, and you may discover that although they don't acknowledge the name of the disease, there's another way that they're dealing with that disease that you didn't know about before you got to where you got to with that community or that person or that disease process. Mm -hmm. um, so the assumption that, again, this is the problem with being a half relativist and a half something else <laughs> is that truth is subjective to a, to most almost ninety percent of the de of degrees, um, and until you recognize that, you can't really get that far. And the idea of the scientific method and the biomedical model is that most things are objective. Um, and so the way that we even define what heart disease is might be different than how you define. I mean, sickle cell in different languages is defined according to the symptoms. And if you don't know the symptoms that might occur in another country that don't occur in the United States or in, or in, the, in Europe, then you wouldn't know that they're talking about sickle cell. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. They're, the diseases are defined by the symptom and not necessarily by the, let's say, um, bacteriology or the um, cellular um, structure change in, in terms of sickle cell. If you don't have the infrastructure to know that there is a cell change, a structural change, then you're going to describe the disease by the symptoms you see. You, you understand? Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind so, of maximum amount of respect and cultural understanding before um, someone from the West or someone from another country comes and tries to help with that thing. So it, I think to me personally, that's where you have to start um, because then you're able to use the language appropriately. 
I can't walk into anywhere and start talking about um, disease with my level of education and think that everybody's going to understand. It mm-hmm. should be the same internationally. You see what I mean? When we teach, we don't, we start with the basics. We try to understand. I mean, that's why we have those tests that, you know, standardized tests that everyone takes to, you know, get into where, wherever they're getting into, or even during elementary and, you know, middle school and high school, they take these standardized tests so that you understand where that student is so that you can meet, well, you're supposed to meet the student where they are, mm-hmm. right? So that you can understand and then they understand things. You're able to use their language to help them get to the next level. It should be the same internationally. I, I think we might be able to convince you you're not a relativist just yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but moving in the equally dangerous direction. Okay. What do you- what do you think is the appropriate uh, relationship between medical practice and religious practice? Oh, golly. Well. Uh, kind of a broad question, but yeah. um, I think oftentimes our um, traditional religious worldviews come into conflict with certain scientific findings. I do and, agree. Yes, that's true. We saw this with like the evolution debates in the United States and um, even debates on gay marriage were very interesting, um, noticing how the science never entered the picture. Right. Uh, right. But do you think that uh, science should just tolerate or the medical community should just tolerate every religious belief about uh, the human body and mind and how it works or there's a certain degree of pushback that's necessary given what we know now i think science progressed to where it progressed to because um if i remember correctly the catholic church lost its power because the science was overwhelming um about the nature of things if you will to use philosophical terms um and I believe that there could be a balance, but I don't think that there ever will be between medicine and religion, only because um, religious beliefs are very old, old, and we tend to hold more than we like to change. Hmm. Now, that being said, there are many different kinds of religious practices that represent people in medicine. And somehow we all figure out how to somewhat balance our, our religious beliefs with our scientific beliefs. There are moments in which I myself experience cognitive dissonance between the two because there are things that are written for me in the Bible that um kind of go up against my practice but i'm taught in school that at the end of the day i'm supposed to do whatever i can to save life and not to take life so that's one thing that's one of the big debates um that happens a lot which is the whole sort of abortion and and all of that. Um, And I think I would be on board with the idea of either, really the idea of either, because I haven't, to be honest, I haven't made up my mind. But I do see a serious problem in that pro-life is only, seems to only last until the child is born. (laughs) And pro-choice similarly only seems to last until the child is born. Um, And I mean that because on the one hand, the child is born and we don't like the idea of supporting the family in whatever means necessary. So right now what we have in the United States is the welfare system or CHIP, things like that. But then on the other side, I see 
that there may be some level of enabling um, of poor choices um, that kind of put people in, in a, a um, generational um, cycle of not understanding that you can rise out of um, your situation or that you, you use support systems for the time that you need support. Um, and that comes from what we were discussing before, there's not the sort of a, not a narcissist, but a lack of understanding that there are other people in the world besides yourself. I guess that is narcissism. Um, and so by using up a resource when you don't need it, you are taking away from others. And so I'm assuming myself, because I was raised this way, that when you are born and you're taught by your family, you should be taught that you're not the only person in the world. You need to care about other people. I'm assuming that right now. So it, you've got both sides of the coin, which is why it's so hard to make that. I still haven't made a decision. Um, I think that if, if, you, if you want to be pro-life, you need to also understand that sometimes situations arise that the child is born and things are hard. Okay. Things are just hard. And you got to support a kid past the point of being born sometimes. Okay. Not every family has the ability to support the child that they've brought into the world because insert law here that says thousand willing and able and ready to do that, then you need to stop squawking. Same goes for the other side of the coin, the pro-choice coin. If we're going to be pro-choice, we need to be educating about healthy lifestyles and healthy ways to conceive. Um, what does it mean to have a child? I don't know if everybody understands what it means to have a child. Mm -hmm. I just spent a whole weekend with my little cousin, I can't have a child. I, 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 I physically can't and I mentally can't because it takes a lot of work and determination. It's not a fly by night thing. And it's irresponsible to think, oh, I'll just do whatever. And if a child comes, it'll be fine. That's irresponsible. Children take planning. This, my cousin had to bring a, a whole suitcase and three bags of things just for one tiny human. I, I'm not ready for that. You see what I mean? There's, there's things that have to happen for either side. You know, the arguments are underdeveloped. They're not well done is where I'm going. Um, so if you're going to quote scripture, it also says that you should care for, the ch for a child. The, the kid isn't just supposed to honor the father and the mother, but the father and the mother are supposed to care for the child. Um, and sometimes that requires a village. Um, and, and, and missing that is missing the whole story of what the Bible says um, we're supposed to do. Um, and I will, I will go there and say that also includes the immigrant. Um, I don't think it's okay to separate one-year-olds from their mothers. Um, in that we have... This country, again, Christopher Columbus didn't discover not one bloody thing, not one. This country is made from immigrants. And the idea that you can be pro-life and watch children be separated is disgusting. And then to go and quote the Bible is ridiculous. Jesus himself was an immigrant. Um, there's actually scripture. If we're going to use the Bible, you know, it, the other problem with these arguments is we take and piecemeal pieces together without reading the whole story. The Bible was written as a story. You can't quote parts that you feel fit your, your issue. You need to read the whole thing, um, which is, you know, that's another soapbox for another day. But I, I think that the, the, a lot of times the, the debates are underdeveloped and again, use quotations incorrectly um, from the Bible. In this case, in the United States is usually how, where it goes to. Um, and I, I think 
I think that that makes it, that also causes a lot of cognitive dissonance for us as healthcare providers, because we are also trying to figure out our way in this sea of confusion, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think there are places where our science agrees with the, with the, um, with the religion. But then I tell people this all the time who challenge me on my own beliefs. God allowed Adam and Eve to pluck from the tree of knowledge. God that created everything in six days and knew what it was that he wanted to do with the world and the humans that they created allowed to happen. It's not necessarily true to say that we are going past what God allowed us or God wants us to do. If God should see fit, he will wipe the earth. He did it. It's in the Bible. Flood the earth. Whatever he wants to do, he will do. So I think to some degree, we, we are operating within the plan that God has written for us. I think there are times when we get a little buck wild for the sake of 90s language um, with our science. But I don't think that I am being irreverent to my religion, which again, I, religion and all these things. Jesus walked the earth like I did. I'm trying to do what the man did. Simple. Um, I, I think that I think that we are operating within what we were allowed to do, uh, if you go back to Adam and Eve. Um, and so as long as we are using our talents in the way that Jesus used his own talents. This is my own personal beliefs. This will be different for someone who um, follows Islam. This will be different for someone who follows Hinduism, which, but I'm saying different, but a lot of times when you look at it, it's stories are similar. Um, so is there a certain degree in that, that there's better and worse interpretations of certain scripture in relation to science? I think maybe an entry point into this question is, how do you take your uh, particular faith and stories like Adam and Eve alongside something like evolutionary biology? Oh, so I, I spoke with my uncle about this the other day, which I think is interesting. And that there's always the fight about, well, did evolution happen and all that? Again, I think that um, there's something, sometimes I think of God as a scientist because what we have as the rendering of his abilities is a book, but we don't necessarily have his lab notebook. This is going to be some serious feather ruffling here. <laughs> when you do labs, a lot of times you fail, like 90% of the time you fail. But the one you publish, usually because of the way our culture is in science, it's changing, but still some of this is around. You publish the good one. You publish the one that actually worked. Um, you may discuss that you tried it this many different ways, but the work that you finally publish is the good one. Um, so who's to say there isn't a lab notebook that we don't know about? Of all the different ways God put dust and water together to create a human being, number one. And why can't they just exist together? I just exist together. Because we don't have the whole story. For I, I, We don't know the whole story. We weren't here. We weren't all born whenever this amalgamation of humanity was created. So... For me, it's kind of, I guess you could say I'm kind of up in the air um, about that debate. I think evolution happened. I also think the Bible is stories that we need to learn from. Mm -hmm. And there's, I mean, I've also heard that um, there's a position on Revelation where uh, God can't reveal. Um, things to people outside of their particular context and time. And that that's, what, that's that is a beautiful 
way of explaining why the world has evolved in different ways. If you think about it, really, we are actively evolving right now, okay? Every time you have a conversation with someone, you have just evolved in either a good or a bad or neutral way. That's the reason that there's differences across countries. That's the reason why you see different types of diseases happening in different places. That you, we may never see some of these diseases unless the person travels with it. There, evolution, to think that evolution, okay, started on the first day this year. Evolution, the term is a process of change. And what is a process? Slow. Change doesn't happen over overnight. It doesn't happen because Genesis chapter one started. That's why I'm talking, that's why I was mentioning this lab notebook idea. We don't know what happened before Genesis. We don't know what happens after Revelations. So the idea that evolution began and has stopped or what is that silliness to me silliness because 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 <laughs> we are actively evolving mm -hmm. the, I, I, I mean that's just i guess that's my position on it i suppose yeah i think i think we might have some uh, interesting differences there but i i definitely appreciate your willingness to uh recognize the cognitive dissonance that can sometimes exist and approach that in a nuanced way which is what i think uh, a lot of traditional religious people could learn from um, i think yeah i yeah i just live in my cognitive dissonance i guess <laughs> i think we all do yeah. we're all capable of keeping two sets of books yeah um well sort of to wrap up um we usually like to or at least i do end a podcast with a uh life lesson or something along those lines so i'm wondering what your practice and study of nursing um the, like the most profound or significant thing to you that it's taught you i think i think that as i was I was starting to get to a really dark place in terms of my belief in humanity. Um, just watching just awful things happening around the world. But in this time that I've entered nursing and, and my PhD work, the most profound thing I think I have encountered is the spirit that exists in altruistic human beings. Um, there, I'm thinking of a person in particular right now who I truly believe understands the necessity of Other oh, I'm sorry, cut out again. Can you say that one more time? Meaning, yeah, I said I, 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 I'm thinking of a person, and this person understands what it means to care for another person, so that you yourself are well, and you find meaning, but also do whatever it is that waiting back. and i'm you know i i say that because we have this uh, i'll go to facebook you know all those i don't know if you remember in the beginning of facebook and even till now we have all these like chain email things that go around and send it back to me if you really if you care and do this if you care send it back to me Post it and tag me, and it's not what the world is about. It's not about us, 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 me, me, me. It's not what it's about. Um, and 
in my time, my short time as a nurse and in my own life overall, and what I'm learning more in my PhD studies is I myself am not enough. But when I work for and with others, for and with, not for myself, not for myself. Um, when I work for and with others, I'm greater. Greater because I'm fulfilling the purpose that was written for me as a human be being. And also me, just me, Stephanie. Um, I think that's part of the greatest lesson I've ever learned so far in life and in nursing, but then also that I'm not better because I have things and another is not less because they don't have the things I have. Everybody's story means something. Everybody's narrative is important. And growing to understand that there are other truths, there are other ways of knowing the world has been a lifelong thing because, as I said, I didn't grow up in an American household. I grew up in the United States, but I didn't, my house was an African house. Um, so I always knew that there was an, uh, another way of living. But I have only truly come to respect that in my mo more my older years, mm. if you will. So respect, I think at the end of both of those ideas is the idea that I breathe oxygen like my brothers and my sisters breathe oxygen everywhere else. I'm, I'm, who am I? Who am I to demean, belittle, degrade, make smaller anybody else whose lungs do the same thing that my lungs do? I'm not, I'm not anybody. So I think that's the greatest lesson I have. I can talk a lot, I can ruffle a lot of feathers, but at the end of the day, I respect different ideas and I welcome them because that's how you grow. Um, so that was beautifully said. And I, I really appreciate you coming on and taking the time. Um, and I hope we can do it again sometime soon. It sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you so much for this time. I appreciate it. You've been great. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, hopefully next time um, I might get uh, an addiction specialist or a software engineer or a priest. So all of those will <laughs> up in the air. That would be great. That'll be on the next one. Um, was there anything else you wanted to point people to? Um, I know you've sent me a few great articles, but uh, any reason? I think, something? I think if anybody wants to sort of understand maybe my way of thinking, they can read um, my paper and you can see a little insight or, or keyhole into how I think. Um, but um, if you want to learn more about sickle cell and you have a limited amount of time, um, you can read um, some integrative reviews about the disease in, in on the continent of Africa. Um, by uh, one one study is by uh, Mulamba and Wilson. Um, it's in the Journal of International, or excuse me, the International Journal of uh, Africa Nursing Sciences. Um, and then, additionally, if you want to read something more philosophical, you could read um, about the uh, about phrenesis and the epistemological journey through research undertakings involving human participants in the context of Sierra Leone. Um, that's one paper. And then again, if you want to read uh, more about my understanding of culture and how it informs health, you could read a um, paper by Napier and colleagues entitled Culture and Health. It's published in the Lancet Commissions. Um, there, are, there are many sources of information. And um, I think 
anyone you choose, you can learn something. And um, if anybody has questions or thoughts, it's easy to find me. Um, but I think those are good ways to to start if you have interest in this work. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And we'll make sure to uh, have you back on keep the conversation going. Thank you so much.